The objective of this video is to introduce the principles of closed loop regulation for power converters. We're going to specifically be talking about the regulation of the single pole double throw converter that we've been developing in this class. I've sketched the, the equivalent circuit of this converter down below, where we view our pole voltage in terms of a duty ratio multiplied by our throw voltage. And before we get started, let's talk about what it means to regulate and why we would regulate. So why regulation? An example use case for this is that we know that if we have a change in either our input voltage or our load resistance, we will see our output voltage change. And we've previously defined regulation in terms of line regulation and load regulation and our desire to obtain 0% regulation, meaning that if, changes in our imp if we have a change in our input voltage, we would prefer to have our output voltage not change at all. And we've talked about how with passive circuitry that just isn't possible. You always have some kind of change. So our desire now is to, is to actively regulate our circuit, and we're going to do this by varying the duty ratio. So our, our mission may be to maintain a constant output voltage despite any deviations in our load resistance or input voltage, and the mechanism that we change in order to make this happen is the duty ratio of our active device, of our MOSFET. So the idea is that we will be regulating our duty ratio to keep something constant. Maybe we're going to be keeping our input power constant. Maybe we're going to be keeping our output current constant. It could be our output power. If this is used for induction heating, uh, it might actually be some that it might actually be the temperature of what we're heating. We might, we might be trying to keep the temperature constant. So the idea is that regulation is the active manipulation of our duty ratio in order to keep some output quantity at a constant value despite any interruptions, despite any disturbances to the system. Notice that I'm using the word regulation. Regulation is specifically tied to this idea of keeping a quantity constant despite disturbances or disturbance rejection. We could also talk about controllers and control. Control is the idea of tracking an input reference and from the theory point of view it ends up actually being the same thing. The difference of the terminology of regulation versus control is just about the objective you're trying to, to achieve or how you see the world, whether you're seeing the world through the lens of maintaining a constant output while rejecting disturbances, or whether you're seeing the world through the lens of trying to track an input variable. So we'll use regulator and controller as synonyms, or interchangeably, as we develop this. Okay, so we've got our equivalent circuit, and now we're going to sketch up uh, what is going on with a regulator system in order to maintain a constant output voltage. So first, we have some reference for what we want our output voltage to be. We'll call this V out star. We're going to take this and subtract from it a measurement of what our current output voltage is. And we're going to assume that we have some sensor in order to make this measurement that has a certain gain to it, a gain of beta. So the quantity that we're actually comparing to V out star is going to be beta times V out. So this quantity right here is beta V out. And out of this block comes epsilon. This is our error. V out star minus beta V out is the error, and we feed this into a block, which is our regulator or our controller. So right now, the contents of this block are a mystery to us. That is one of the objectives of, the, of this class, is learn how to design this regulator. We can express it for the time being as just some transfer function, G C of S, which takes as its input the error in our system, and gives us an output of a control voltage. We'll say it's VC. So this could be either a physical circuit or it could be a digital implementation in a DSP. We're going to be developing this from the point of view of a physical circuit later in later videos. VC, our control voltage, goes into a pulse width modulation block which converts that to a duty ratio. The duty ratio is then applied back to our circuit, is then applied back to this, the duty ratio of the active device in our circuit, which updates our equivalent circuit. And if we want to be very detailed about this, we can acknowledge that we're going to saturate our duty ratio 
at the level of 0 and 1. We can't have a duty ratio more than 1, and we can't have a duty ratio of less than 0. And then our, we have our duty ratio come out. It connects back to our physical circuit. So right now, we don't know what beta is, we don't know what G C of S is, and we don't know what is in this block for our pulse width modulator. Let's review pulse width modulation and, and populate that block first. <clears throat> so we previously introduced pulse width modulation when we talked about gate drivers and buck and boost converters. And when we, when we first introduced it, we talked about it in terms of having a sawtooth carrier that's compared against a signal, a duty ratio, in order to obtain a switching waveform. So let's make this a little bit more concrete. Let's say that we have coming into this our control voltage VC. So that's the voltage right here. That's this voltage right here. And we can draw this as a comparator. And we'll say that this control voltage is compared against a triangle waveform. So this could be the sawtooth carrier we talked about last time, which, which goes like this. Or it could be a symmetric triangle that goes up and down. It doesn't it doesn't actually matter from the point of view of the transfer function of this block. Out of this block comes VD, which is the voltage that is going to our MOSFET gate driver. So this is the on-off voltage. So it could be a one or a zero. It could be five volts and zero volts. It could be 3.3 .3 volts and zero volts. It, it just depends on how you've connected the circuit up. It could be plus five volts and minus five volts. The point is that this is the signal that's going to our MOSFET gate driver and amplified to the voltage needed to turn our MOSFET on and off. So the way this block works is that we have this carrier waveform, the triangle waveform, and we can see the triangle waveform has some peak of VP, and we compare it against VC. So whenever VC is larger than our triangle waveform, the output is high, and whenever it's less, the output is low. So I just drew this as the sawtooth carrier, but actually in this lecture, I want to show you how the, how the triangle, the symmetric triangle carrier is the same thing. So let's do that. So now I've drawn a carrier again, but it's this triangle waveform, and it has a peak again of VP. And we'll put in blue our control voltage VC. So when VC is larger than VP, when this voltage right here is higher than this voltage over here, the output is high. So for this region, now it goes high, now it goes low, and now it comes back up to being high over here, and we have this pattern repeat itself. So the period of this carrier is again equal to our switching frequency, TS, and the pulse width of our, of our signal to our gate driver is going to be equal to D times TS. That's the fraction of time that the MOSFET is on over its entire switching interval. <clears throat> and so we can see that, that what this block is actually doing in terms of, of converting um, VC to a duty ratio, so remember if we go back up to this circuit up here, we have VC on one side of the block and a duty ratio on the outside of the block. In terms of converting VC to a duty ratio, so here we have VC, and out comes our duty ratio. We're actually just dividing this by the value of VP. It would be the same block, regardless of if it is the sawtooth waveform that we previously talked about, or the symmetric triangle waveform. The difference for why you might pick a sawtooth for versus a triangle waveform comes up when you start to consider inverters that consist of multiple single pole double throw switches connected across an impedance you end up getting different harmonics in your output switching pattern. Okay, so we now know how to populate the PWM block in our diagram above. This is a one over VP, where VP is, is the voltage of our, as the peak voltage of our carrier waveform. And if you were curious to see a comparator in real life, you can look up the Texas Instruments part number LM311. This is a comparator, as a high-speed comparator, it could be used with either the sawtooth carrier or the symmetric triangle carrier waveform. And you can search this in DigiKey and you'll, you'll come up with the data sheet and the, and the specs. At this point, we've got a waveform, or, or we've got our diagram up here, 
And we now know all components of it except for our regulator, beta, and how to interpret this broader circuit over here. So let's redraw this into a simpler form without our circuit connected. And we'll again start by considering V0 star, comparing that against a measurement, which is going to be again beta times V0. And yet again, we've got an error here. We'll feed this into our regulator block. And now, instead of connecting this straight to our circuit, we're going to connect it to a transfer function, which is going to model our converter. So the transfer function is going to convert duty ratio into our output voltage. And this is a transfer function for our converter. Out of this transfer function comes V out. And then we measure that V out and we feed it back into our converter using a negative feedback path, our controller using a negative feedback path. So this is the complete block diagram of what we're doing in transfer function form. And so again, at this point, we know what our PWM block is, but we don't know what the rest of the blocks are. The regular block is, is what we will design. And the converter block is going to be determined through small signal analysis. We're not going to do that in this video. That will be a future class session. We'll use small signal analysis techniques to, der to derive this converter block. But for now, let's build up the basic principles of control theory and how to apply it to a converter. And the first item on our list is to determine the value of beta. So if we are operating in a situation where we have no error, error equals zero. That means that epsilon is zero, and this is our desired situation. That means that we're at exactly the output voltage that we intend to be at. There's no disturbance going on right now. Or if there is a disturbance, we've completely rejected it with our regulator. So in this situation, that epsilon is equal to zero means that V0 star minus beta times V0 is zero. And we can use this to solve for the value of beta. So beta is simply V0 star over V0. And this means that if we want to command 1.2 volts, so if we want to give as a V0 star reference 1.2 volts, so this is an example. If we want to command 1.2 volts equals V0 star in order to get an output voltage of 120 volts, we can solve for beta. So beta is what en enables us to use a low voltage reference in order to operate our circuit. So if we want to get 120 volts out of the circuit, we probably don't want to be, attaching, uh, to be attaching 120 volt signal to the input of our regulator. It sounds dangerous. We want to use a low voltage signal. And to accomplish this, we, we place a gain on our feedback sensor in order to allow our control electronics to operate at low voltages. And so we can immediately determine the value of beta based off of this information. This is a design spec. The design spec is saying that I nominally want 120 volt output, but I want to be able to provide an input to my controller of 1.2 volts. Beta is called our sensor gain, and it's also called the negative feedback factor. And it is a design parameter. So there's two things we get to design in the circuit. One is beta, and the other is our controller, GC, or our regulator. So now we have two unknowns left here. One is the design that we're coming up for our controller, and the other is the small signal analysis in order to get a transfer function for our converter. Let's work with this block diagram a little further. Let's simplify it. What we're going to do is write out an expression for the loop transfer function or a loop gain of our, of our feedback path. And we're going to do this by starting at this point right here 
and following the, the feedback path all the way around like this until we get here. So we can say that t of s, or the, of, which is the loop transfer function, is going to be equal to our controller transfer function times our PWM transfer function times our converter transfer function times our sensor gain beta. And we're going to parse this out a little further. We are going to say that this path right here is going to be something we will call g of s, which is equal to t of s divided by beta. So looking at this block diagram up here, g of s is this portion of the feedback path where t of s means that we've taken the, the path the entire, the entire revolution, the entire way around. So we can now sketch an even simpler block diagram for the circuit in terms of g and beta. We can have our input v0 star attached to with a negative feedback path of beta. So comparing these two block diagrams, we've got g of s connected here, and we've got beta connected down here. And again, g c of s is our regulator, and we will design it. And v0 by d of s is, our, is what we'll obtain via small signal analysis in a later video. So when we look at this block diagram that we've added over here, we can write a transfer function of v out of s divided by v0 star of s. And first we're gonna make the observation that we said that when we have no error, we end up with this relationship being one over beta. And the, the truth is that when we have some error, we're going to have to multiply this by a correction factor. And this correction factor is called f. It's going to be a transfer function f of s. So this is what we'd like to have is 1 over beta. But in reality, in the physical system that we'll actually obtain, we're going to end up having to have a correction factor in here so that we don't, the, the point is, is that we want v out to, always equal, to be always equal to v0 star divided by beta. However, we can't physically realize that. We don't have good enough parts. We, uh, if, if the world was 100% perfect, we could obtain this, but in reality, it's not achievable. So we just do the best job that we can. And doing the best job that we can is all about how we design the controller and how we shape this f of s term. So if we start uh, looking at this block diagram here and driving a transfer function for v out in terms of of itself and v star. So if we just we just plug in that v out of s from that diagram is clearly equal to g of s times v out star of s minus beta times v out of s. We can rearrange terms. To get this famous transfer function here, which is that v out of s divided by v out star of s is equal to g of s over 1 plus beta times g of s. And this transfer function is the famous transfer function that was derived by Harold Black of Bell Labs in the 1920s. And Harold Black was trying to solve a problem of transmitting telephone signals over very long wires in the US and how these signals would become distorted due to the nonlinearities of vacuum tubes, due to uh, the lossy long transmission lines used to, to, to route the signal. And he was thinking about this for a long time over many years and uh, there's kind of a fun famous story about how he was riding a, a ferry one day and, and had the New York Times with him and and suddenly an epiphany struck him and he ended up writing out this equation or, or a form very similar to it, which ended up forming the basis of, of classical control theory. 
and and was one of the crown jewel achievements of engineering in the in the 20th century and of course at the time this wasn't recognized it took him actually seven years to even get the patent on it and uh, lots of brouhaha back and forth with the patent office not believing that such a system could ever actually work and and his colleagues at Bell Labs who were uh, far more famous and, and had lengthy pedigrees behind their name, not really understanding the significance of what he had created, but, um, but ultimately ended up, you know, as I said, being one of the cornerstone achievements of, of engineering in the, in the 20th century. So I'll, I'll attach, if anybody's interested, I'll attach a couple um, in memoriam type papers about Harold Black onto our Canvas website. I think it's a, a rather fun story. So anyway, we have this transfer function, g of s over 1 plus beta times g of s. And we can recognize, as we had defined g of s to be t of s divided by beta, we can rewrite this in terms of t of s as, as this expression. So now we have our term, we, now we have our correction factor, f of s. It's equal to the transfer function, which is t of s divided by 1 plus t of s. And we can see that f of s actually looks like the transfer function of 1 times t of s over 1 plus t of s, which implies that we have the quantity 1 in parallel with t. So we know that we want f of s to be equal to 1. And if we talk about two parallel impedances, we know that the way to make that happen is to have one of the impedances, is to have the other impedance be very large. So this means that we want this means that this is approximately equal to 1 if t is large. So any frequency that t is very large, we're, ended, we're going to end up getting our nearly ideal transfer function that we have up here, which is just v out of s over v out star of s equal to 1 divided by beta. But any frequency where t is not large, suddenly t is the is the easy impedance path, or, or it, it reduces the value of f of s to a smaller quantity. And we can see that we may start to have issues. So at this point, we're ready to quantify the error of our system. And we can put this in the per unit system, or, or in other words, our normalized error. So error is going to be equal to v0 star minus beta times v0. And we know that from looking at our, our block diagram up here, right? So this is, we're just looking at the definition of error right here as being v0 star minus beta v0. And normalizing it means that we divide it by our desired reference. And if we plug in, if we plug in this equation right here, We can cancel terms. And we can finally notice that this is approximately equal to 1 over t of s when t is large. So that means that if t at a certain frequency is equal to 100, we have a per unit error of about 1%. If t is equal to 10, we have a per unit error of 10%. If it's equal to 1,000, we have a per unit error of 0.1%. So this ends up informing our design process. This means that, that we can say that for DC conditions, we want to consider t at omega equals 0. It, needs, it had better be greater than 1 over our acceptable error. So if we have a design spec that says at DC, you need to have less than 1% error, that means that T of omega equal to zero had better be greater than 1,000 uh, or 100. And remember that the way that we can modify the value of T is by our design of the controller, of the regulator. So the converter, every other block of the system is now fixed. We now know what beta is going to be. We now uh, know what our PWM block is going to be. The converter block is, is we, we get what we get. We get what we physically have in our system, our inductances, our capacitances, our switches, all that determines the converter block. And our one degree of freedom to manipulate things is to change the design of our 
controller or regulator to shape the Bode plot to shape the transfer function of this g c of s. So we're getting hints at how we might want to uh, uh, factors that might influence our design of that of that controller or that regulator. <clears throat> and one of the hints that we've talked about now is is error, steady state error, or error at a certain frequency. The second thing that we need to introduce is the notion of stability. And stability is absolutely essential for us. We cannot let V out go unstable. We can't let our output voltage become unbounded because it will cause something to explode. It, will, it may damage our customer's sensitive equipment. We may have a lawsuit on our hands. We might blow up our lab. We might simply be wasting a lot of money or we might be gain a reputation for having poor quality converters. The, the, the point is that we need to absolutely guarantee that our converter will not go unstable. And so back in the history of, of development of control theory, after Harold Black came up with, um, with, this, famous, with this famous equation, he immediately assumed that he wanted to have T be as large as possible but then quickly noticed that sometimes some values of t would cause his system to become unstable. And he didn't know why. It, it, it was quite a conundrum. Uh, he ended up talking to some of the other famous researchers at Bell Labs, uh, namely Bode and, and Nyquist, and they ended up developing uh, a stability theory for how to investigate what values of t might cause the system to become unstable. And so for our simple example here, we can say that we can take a look at our, our closed loop transfer function again. And we can realize that as we're talking about um, omega going to higher and higher frequencies, our transfer function t of s by default has to go to zero. Um, in order for it to be physically realizable, as frequency goes to infinity, there becomes a certain point where we can't have a non-zero gain. Our, uh, just the physics of the conservation of energy in the world, you, your semiconductors are only so fast, at a certain point you get to such a high frequency that they cannot respond, and your loop transfer function is simply going to have a magnitude of zero. And so if it, turn, it turns out that if along this path, as we increase our frequency greater and greater, when we get to the point that that the gain of our, tra our loop transfer function is simply 1, which would be equal to 0 decibels, at that point we see that the angle of it, the argument of it, is equal to 180 degrees or negative 180 degrees. we have instability. So at this point, that would mean that, that T of J omega is equal to one angle negative 180 degrees, which is equal to negative one. So if we plug that back into our closed loop transfer function here, we see that we're going to have negative one over one minus one, which is infinity. One over beta, negative one over zero, And that is an unstable response. So we can see that we have, we have a stability issue if we allow our phase angle of T of J omega to be 180 degrees at the same time as we have unity output. And so this means that we need to make sure that we have our magnitude less than zero decibels when our angle becomes 180 degrees. We're going to talk more generally about stability theory in, a, in another video. But I want to introduce the concept here that you can see that there exists a, uh, a value of T of J omega which will clearly cause our system to blow up. And we need to design our, it's our job to design our regulator so that this condition cannot happen, so that it simply does not exist. All right, let's conclude this video with an example. Suppose that we have a loop gain under DC conditions of 50. What is our DC error percentage? 
So what is our, if I tell you that we have a DC loop gain of 50, tell me what is the percent error or the per unit error of our closed loop regulator. Hit pause and press play when you're ready to resume. So I just told you that T of zero is equal to 50. And we know that the per unit error is approximately equal to one over T of zero which is going to be 